everyone for coming out. Um, so I'm going to try to do something a little difficult today, um, which is I want to give you the um, a broad history of U.S. empire by looking at a number of different interventions. I'm going to take it from 1898 to about the 1980s, because I think, like Craig said, we often focus on um, single territories or colonies, um, and we often focus on very specific time periods. So I want to just give you a broad picture. And when I was asked to do this talk, the best way I thought about getting at this was to give you a biography of the institution, the bureaucracy, that connected all of these places to see like the empire. And in that case, we have the, the can you hear me all right? Should I use this? I'll take this. The, uh, the, the Bureau of Insular Affairs, which I would imagine many people have never heard of. Um, and so this comes from the 1898 project, which was uh, from the National Portrait Gallery um, that we're really responding to with, uh, with this event and the events that will happen in April uh, that showed all of the, the colonies that were acquired after 1898 and the collections the National Portrait Gallery and the Smithsonian had on them. Um, the, the title for this talk is borrowed, for those of you who are political scientists or sociologists, you might recognize from a well-known book by Jim Scott, Seen Like a State. And, and one thing that Scott points out in this book is, if you see like a state, um, you, you, you can understand how the state forces what he calls legibility on its subjects, right, by radically simplifying things, um, you know, that have certain natural relationships, by giving last names, um, by creating units of measurement. Um, by establishing national languages. And so seen like a state requires this radical simplification that takes people out of, out of natural relationships and contexts and makes them legible to bureaucracies. Um, and what I'm going to try to talk to you about today is how the Bureau of Insular Affairs did that for U.S. empire. And this map, I've always thought, is a particular good representation of seeing like an empire. And it's an old map that just presents the, quote, relative size of the United States and its possessions. But it gives you an idea of how the, the colonies were seen from Washington, right? Only in relationship to the United States, um, kind of divorced from what any, any geographical or cultural context they had. The Philippines here is displayed uh, somewhere over Utah. Um, you have Hawaii there, uh, which seems to exist between West Virginia and Ohio. Um, and right across the Blue Ridge Mountains is Puerto Rico. Um, so these are just placed in this map. But I think if you want to understand how the empire saw territories, this is a great visual representation. Um, all, all disconnected from geographic context and existing only in their relationship uh, to the metropolitan United States. Um, sorry, I want to make sure I'm staying on time here. All right. Um, and so the agency I'm going to talk about, the Bureau of Insular Affairs, has gone through various iterations over its years. Um, it started off in the Department of War um, and was founded in 1902. That's where it gets the name, the Bureau of Insular Affairs, as the agency charged in the Department of War with managing the new possessions of the United States after the Spanish-American War. Um, and then in 1934, there's another agency called the Division of Territories and Island Possessions that exists. The, the Bureau of Insular Affairs is later merged into this agency. Um, and it, it evolves slowly as an agency of the Department of the Interior. Um, and it still to, exists today uh, as the Office of Insular Affairs. So that is the broad biography of this agency that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, you can even see that its, its mission or the way it represents itself has changed a bit over the years, right? The, the first seal is in, in quite martial, um, and it's part of the Department of War. There is an eagle, and there are arrows, and now it looks um, you know, far more neutral, and indeed it is. The Office of Insular Affairs today mainly exists to help write grants and do various things, but it is still a colonial agency. It exists to administer U.S. territories. Um, and here's, you know, if you didn't believe me, here's their website page, a snapshot from just yesterday. It's still around. So when we talk about American empire, often we're focused on the wars, moments of annexation, and moments of resistance. And all of this, of course, is central to understanding how the empire develops. But what, what I want to suggest to you today is that a fuller understanding of empire also requires us to understand how the bureaucrats who largely built it saw their role, and how they decided it should be organized. This is perhaps the, one of the most significant members of this group of bureaucrats who built the empire, uh, William Howard Taft, seen here in the Philippines on a water buffalo. 
bigger. What's that? It's hard to tell which one is bigger. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and this, in many ways, is made a little bit easier because these agencies have generated so many records. So if you're interested in studying American empire from the perspective of bureaucracy, there is no shortage of records for you to investigate. Uh, record Group 350, which is the record group in the National Archives for the Bureau, um, has about six million text documents, only a few of which have been digitized, so I'll be drawing from some of those today. Um, and its successor agency, the record of the Office, or the office of Territories, um, has about four million documents. And so you have 10 million documents that record the history of how the bureaucracy saw the empire. Um, like, uh, like Craig said, this is drawing from some of my previous work, uh, so my book that ends at the end of World War I, and also incorporating a lot of new work. Um, and some of the new archival work I've been doing to try to understand this later period of empire. Um, and, and one of the things that is difficult, uh, makes it difficult to study empire, of course, is that many of the most significant documents are scattered throughout the country in various presidential archives, in private collections, aside from just RG350 and the Office of Territories. And so it takes a fair bit of investigation to really uncover this story. Um, so I'll share with you some of those, uh, some of those documents today. Um, and so here's the outline for the talk today. I know that the abstract said I talk a little bit about Guam. I, as I wrote this, I decided there just wasn't time to do that case justice. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the Philippines and the Dominican Republic, um, which the BIA played an essential role in. Um, and then um, through the Office of Territories, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Virgin Islands. And so I, I chose two Caribbean territories because one of the goals of this 1898 project is to expand our horizons a little beyond the Pacific and understand um, how these Caribbean territories were connected to the same sorts of governance governed by many of the same people and the agencies as the Pacific territories. And then I'll just close um, and talk about the, the BIA's legacy in U.S. empire to, to bring us to the present very quickly. So this first part is about the birth of the Bureau of Insular Affairs as an imperial manager, promoter, and what I think is best term, an imperial fixer to solve problems on the fly and very quickly. It was never a particularly big agency, um, but it was a very powerful agency. Um, and so I'll present two um, uh, information and evidence from the Philippines and the Dominican Republic in this first part. Um, so here, just to give you a sense of what the empire looked like in 1900, um, this is, um, these are all the territories as well as the trade routes um, that are connected in, in 1900. Um, and the BIA is born at a particular moment, and so you have to understand the political context, right? We've talked about 1898, but of course, the war didn't end in 1898. There was still the Philippine-American War, which raged for three more years, um, there were approximately 200,000 Filipinos, Filipino civilians who probably lost their lives in this war. Uh, there were significant casualties on both sides. Um, and so although we often talk of the empire beginning in the Spanish-American War ending in 1898, um, that's true, the war with, between the United States and Spain ended in 1898, but it continued on for much longer between the Philippine Republic and the United States for those years. So that's an important political, part of the political context in the birth of the BIA. Uh, the second is the American domestic political context. Um, and so imperialism became a major issue in the election of 1900. This was the election between um, William McKinley and William Jennings Bryan. Um, and you can see that all of a sudden, uh, the notion of annexing colonies, which had been wildly popular in the early days of the Spanish-American War, uh, became far more politically controversial by this point. And um, so this is the political advertisement for the McKinley-Roosevelt um, election campaign. Um, and I've always thought that, and so, so there's compar this comparison between the Democrats and the Republicans here, right, under the Democratic Party, right, with industry is, as, uh, is collapsing, there's a run on the bank, um, there's miserable Spanish rule in Cuba, but under the Republicans, under the McKinley administration, you can see here on, on the right side, uh, industry is successful. Um, there's a run to the bank, not a run on the bank, um, and successful uh, um, uh, governance in Cuba. But perhaps the most interesting thing is what they centered here, uh, which is a McKinley quote, the American flag has not been planted in foreign soil to acquire more territory, 
but for humanity's sake. Uh, a, a strangely defensive thing to include as the central part of a campaign that was largely built on imperialism. And this is in part because there was a very important and active anti-imperial element in the Spanish-American, I mean, in, in the Senate, um, and William Jennings Bryan largely built his campaign for president um, around uh, questioning imperialism, opposing imperialism. And so uh, there are two things that have to be solved immediately um, by the Bureau of Insular Affairs when it's created, right? Uh, there is concern about the Philippine-American War, um, and there is a lot of political controversy about whether or not to acquire colonies. And so the BIA is designed by the Secretary of War, Elihu Root. Interestingly enough, it's not designed by a military official. It's designed by a lawyer, uh, probably the most famous corporate lawyer in the United States at the time, who was mainly responsible for creating corporate trusts. Elihu Root had never served a day in his life in the military. What he had done is be responsible for designing some of the most important trusts in New York, which is why McKinley picked him for this role, precisely so he could figure out how to manage the new colonies. Um, because he, Elihu Root famously said, I'm not, a, I'm not um, a military officer, I don't know anything about these places, and McKinley responded to him saying, I don't need a military officer, I need a lawyer for this job. And so Elihu Root gets to work on designing a system of colonial management. And he confronts two problems, two problems that the BIA ends up being designed to solve. Uh, the first is that there are few financial resources from the domestic American state and relatively little administrative capacity to manage American colonies. Um, the, the United States at this time is famously called by one political scientist a state of courts and parties, meaning that there isn't a very capable or robust bureaucracy, uh, which initially makes it very difficult for them to imagine how they're going to create uh, you, what you might think of as a sort of British colonial force. Um, so initially they're confronted by a lack of administrative capacity um, and the complex constraints of the U.S. Constitution, right? In a system of separated powers uh, with a very powerful and in many cases anti-imperial U.S. Senate, how are they going to manage an empire when they're trying to minimize um, uh, uh, potential political fallout from having an empire? Um, and so the answer they come up with um, or rather the lessons that Root draws from this early experience really are perhaps two. Uh, the first is that the empire, um, for lack of a better term, should be, should be hidden. In other words, it should be designed in a way to minimize political attention and oversight. Um, and he comes up with two strategies, and this of course is very stylized. Um, but one way is to monopolize information, to control information coming out of the colonies that might lead to political controversy or investigations. And the second is to demand few metropolitan resources. In other words, to demand relatively few tax dollars that would go into managing the colonies. And this sets up a system where um, they would largely fund themselves and the industries developed would not compete with metropolitan interests. Uh, the second is, as I mentioned, uh, it has to pay for itself. Um, in other words, there has to be a way to enhance administrative economic capacity, but to use colonial resources to do that. Um, and so the strategy here is to forge partnerships with American businesses and finance capital to enhance the capacity of the, the colonial regimes and to develop, develop colonial infrastructure to, to complement the metropolitan economy, largely through bond finance development projects. In other words, uh, bond finance development projects that would be um, managed by the colonies, um, the bonds wouldn't be the responsibility of the United States. So the way the BIA is created is to enhance this, um, this strategy for inconspicuous action. Um, it's developed as a single bureau under the Department of War, um, that would manage all the colonial information, uh, that the colonial governments would report directly to the Bureau of Insular Affairs, and not as had been done under most territorial administrations in the past, where there would be multiple different agencies supervising different parts of different functions in each of the territories. And so there's initial attempt to monopolize that information. So everything has to flow through the Bureau of Insular Affairs. 
The other thing that was enhanced um, by this initial strategy was that there were just two military officers who were largely responsible for managing the BIA for much of its history. Uh, Clarence Edwards for 12 years and Frank McIntyre for the remaining time. So about uh, almost three decades go by with really just two people who are responsible for managing the BIA, uh, which makes it much easier to pull off this um, you know, relatively inconspicuous um, colonial management story. So what does the BIA do? Um, first, they're responsible for promoting the accomplishments of civil governance, which they do very aggressively. Right? Initially, there is a tremendous effort to uh, put out publications like this. What, what has been done in the Philippines? A record of practical accomplishments of, under civil government. Um, they produce this um, uh, gazetteer, uh, which is sent to every member of Congress to try to um, provide facts and figures a very curated set of facts um, to, um, uh, to, to, uh, to promote colonial administration. They're also very quick, and I've always thought this was one of the most interesting decisions they made early on, to develop sedition and libel laws. Um, so a Sedition Act in 1901 is created um, to uh, allow the colonial government to jail journalists they feel are writing negative things about the colonial government. Um, one of the very first acts the colonial government passes. And American, interestingly enough, it's American journalists, not Filipinos, who are the first victims of this law. Um, there is a famous story by an AP correspondent who <coughs> reports that there are, um, uh, that two of the um, apparently pacified provinces suddenly turned hostile. Um, and first, he's immediately arrested. And second, Elihu Root, who remains incredibly powerful in Washington, complains to the Associated Press itself, uh, and he writes that such a course tends to create the very disturbance which it described to make government more difficult and to bring the civil administration on, upon whose prestige and effectiveness our country must depend for successful government into discredit and contempt. And so an immediate attempt to control any sort of negative information uh, coming out of the colonies. This strategy is largely successful. Um, in the early days of Philippine colonial administration. Um, and one piece of evidence that I want to present to you on, about its success um, is the, the quick lack of interest among the American public about the colonies. Um, what, I'm gonna, what, what this shows you is just uh, um, front page articles in five major newspapers from 1895 to 1920 about the Philippines and Puerto Rico. Not a perfect measure, um, but one measure that um, that, that reporting on the colonies begins to decline very, very quickly. The other thing the BIA does um, is create a colonial state with relative resource independence from the metropolitan state. Um, and it does this through a few ways. I don't know why that's going off. Um, it does this through a few mechanisms. Uh, one is that it creates a, a colonial civil service uh, that is disconnected from the American civil service. And so advancement through the colonies means that you have to remain loyal to the Bureau of Insular Affairs or the Philippine colonial state, uh, not to the American national state. There's a system of independent revenues with tax collections uh, that the colonial government can use to spend on its own priorities. Um, and there's an effort to separate it from domestic state finances. Right? There's an independent money supply with an independent gold reserve fund. And, and this allows the colonial government to start doing things like developing bonds to finance colonial, uh, colonial development. Um, and so here's just a few examples of the bonds that they floated. This is for the Philippine Railway Company. Um, there's similar bonds floated to develop roads. Um, and this gives them an independent source of revenue. And this is all orchestrated by the Bureau of Insular Affairs, this agency. Um, here's just an example of this bond issue, which uh, notes the Bureau of Insular Affairs um, <laughs> at the bottom here. And this is significant because in, in many ways it wasn't clear that the U.S. Congress even understood what the BIA was doing. Um, and there were questions about whether or not it, what the, the U.S. government itself uh, would have to guarantee these bonds. And William Howard Taft has asked this question directly in a hearing in 1904. And he basically says, I don't really know what's going on. Um, it just seems to be that American financiers trust the new colonial government of the Philippines 
I, I, don't, I don't understand why they do, he writes, I only know that the banking houses are entirely willing to take the bonds without a guarantee by the government. Um, and yet at the same time, the Bureau of Insular Affairs is carefully putting its name um, on these bond issues um, to at least suggest that the shadow of the US government is behind these bonds. And from their perspective, there's a lot of strategy, I mean, there's a lot of success with this strategy. Right? There are huge amounts of money, money that the colonial government owes, not the US government, spent in building railroads and other roads throughout the Philippines um, to, to create a sugar industry that in theory could um, be exported to the metropolitan United States. All of this is done through the BIA, this tiny agency that created these relationships with Wall Street that financed these development projects. Something the colonial state itself probably would have been un unable to do, which was dominated by military officers, and something that the US Congress didn't fully understand they were doing. I want to talk about another case of imperial rule here, and this is the Dominican Republic. Here I'm showing you the uh, various forms of rule that the US adopted. There's more than one. Um, you know, you can see Puerto Rico, the Philippines, Guam, American Samoa. These are more formal colonies. You also get what I call receivership or dollar diplomacy colonies in the Dominican Republic, Haiti, Nicaragua, and Liberia, and then territorial forms of rule that we had here in Hawaii. Um, I don't have time to go into all of these, um, but I do want to talk to you about the Dominican Republic because it's another place where the BIA played a key role. So the Dominican Republic, in 1903, it defaults on a massive debt, $33 million. And Theodore Roosevelt, who's now president because McKinley was assassinated, is concerned that a European power is going to take it over, which would threaten the planned canal in Panama. Uh, Roosevelt takes control of the DR, um, and he plans to manage it as a receivership, but the Senate rejects the treaty, which creates a major problem for him, because all of a sudden he doesn't have legal authority uh, to be in the DR. And so he turns to the Bureau of Insular Affairs, uh, the colonial fixer. Elihu Root is back now as Secretary of State. He comes back partially to facilitate this. Um, and they decide, rather than using US government resources to refinance this bond, um, and to refinance the Dominican debt, they're going to turn to Wall Street. Um, and so there is a long process that goes on with negotiating what it would take for Wall Street to refinance the Dominican debt. And there's initially a lot of pushback. What I'm showing you here is a, a letter from J.P. Morgan to the Bureau of Insular Affairs, suggesting that the whole value of the bonds would depend entirely upon the form of interference contemplated by the United States government. In other words, much like the Philippines, they needed some guarantee that this money would be safe. And the answer is for the Bureau of Insular Affairs to establish a customs receivership, where they would manage all of the customs revenue um, coming into the DR, they would pay the bond, so Wall Street would be okay. Um, and, um, and then they would return the rest of the money to the Dominican Republic. Uh, the BIA officials are brought in, some from the Philippines that I'll show you in a minute, to manage this. Um, and a lot of the staff are dispatched from the Philippines. And one example of how this system worked is through the career of George, um, George Colton who is charged with leading the Dominican receivership. And, and you can see why I wanted to pick the Bureau of Insular Affairs just through his career. He starts in the army, he becomes a customs collector in Manila, then he's dispatched to the Dominican Republic to manage this receivership, and then later in his career he's sent back to the Philippines, and then even later he returns as the governor of Puerto Rico. This is a sort of American colonial bureaucrat with expertise in these relationships. And the institutional design is, is somewhat similar, right? The Bureau of Insular Affairs is managing this Dominican receivership um, in concert with the bankers who refinance the debt. But it's very hard to understand from the outside what's going on. It's even hard for Congress to understand what's going on with these particular relationships between uh, the BIA and the bankers. So that's early empire. And I want to give you a flavor for how the BIA manages somewhat later empire, um, because it shifts, and it shifts when it enters the Department of the Interior. Um, how am I doing on time? Okay, I'll, I'll be done relatively soon. Um, and I call this the period of building loophole economies, um, which really is what the BIA becomes charged with in the 1930s. Um, and this 
for lack of a better term, and maybe someone has a better idea for how to describe this, um, I describe it as an industrialization process that favors industries, not because of, not for some reason that makes the, the place they're developed um, you know, particularly well suited to those industries, but because of the political relationship that colony has with the United States, um, a particular ta uh, tax or tariff relationship, which often becomes the model for economic development in the territories starting in the 1930s. And the example I want to give you today is from the Virgin Islands. Um, Puerto Rico is a slightly more complicated case, so that's why I've chosen the USVA. I also think it's one people are probably a little less familiar with. So the Virgin Islands did not come to the United States after the Spanish-American War. They were purchased in 1916. The treaty was ratified in 1917, primarily because Woodrow Wilson was afraid that Denmark would be seized by Germany and it would give the Germans a place to attack the United States. That's sort of where things sit with the USVI um, until Herbert Hoover takes office. And Virgin, Islands, uh, Virgin Islanders, understandably, have never forgiven Hoover for this particular remark that he made in 1931 when he was the first president to visit, uh, that they uh, may uh, have some military value sometime. Opinion is, uh, upon this question is much divided. In any event, when we paid 25 million for them, we acquired an effective poorhouse comprising 90% of the population. Hoover is the first president to visit the Virgin Islands, but he does almost nothing to solve this problem. Uh, the problem does, though, begin to get some traction during the Roosevelt administration during the New Deal. The Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico and some other colonies are part of a bootstrap development project, a huge New Deal project, um, partially motivated out of, a, uh, of embarrassment, of concerns about um, political activity to quickly develop these territories. Um, and the person charged with this in the Virgin Islands is a New Dealer named Ernest Greening, who later becomes governor of Alaska, interestingly enough. To, to find these papers, you have to go to Fairbanks. Um, but he's charged with this bootstrap development in the Virgin Islands. And so this later stage of empire, you see an aggressive state-led attempt to develop economies um, in the territories. And in the Virgin Islands, it's uh, a company known as VICO, which is a government-owned corporation that creates rum and sugar and, er and is an early uh, developer of the tourism industry. Here's a letter from uh, Franklin Roosevelt to the governor of the Virgin Islands uh, congratulating him on the government purchase of several large sugar factories as well as the very first hotel in the Virgin Islands. This is the beginning of this idea of loophole economics. I'm trying to, to nurture industries that would tie the territories closer to the United States. After 1954, the Organic Act in the Virgin Islands, there's a little bit of a shift. VICO is shut down partially because there's some fears that it's a little too socialistic. Um, and the, there's a move to, um, to try to create industries uh, that are targeted specifically uh, for the tariff or tax exemptions that the territories are eligible for. And this is where it gets very strange, um, I've always felt. So one of the big industries that the Virgin Islands gets is watch manufacturing. That's decided um, through the Office of Territories as the ideal industry for the Virgin Islands. Um, because a certain amount of uh, raw materials can be brought there, they can be, watches can be manufactured, and then they can be re-exported to the United States. Um, and so watchmaking, this is, a, this is a letter from one of the chief Office of Territories uh, bureaucrats um, explaining how they ended up with watch, watches, uh, that they are, um, they're not, they won't owe um, American tariffs, uh, they're very uh, easy to ship, um, they're relatively easy to manufacture, um, and so for this reason, for the loophole economics reasons, watches become the industry in the Virgin Islands. And this is really something that the Office of Territories picks for this very reason. Um, and so all of a sudden the Virgin Islands economy becomes very dependent on watches, um, until Congress decides that they're too good at making watches um, and increases, um, um, increases the tariffs for watch manufacturing in the Virgin Islands. There's a similar story that happens in Guam um, and certainly in the Philippines with the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, the other big industry ends up being petrochemicals um, because if you establish a 
refinery on the Virgin Islands, you can re-export some of that oil to the domestic United States. And so the Virgin Islands gets an enormous uh, Hess, which is a huge oil company on the East Coast. One of the largest oil refineries in the world is built on St. Croix uh, to take in raw oil to refine it and re-export it to the United States, something that does has done untold amounts of environmental damage um, and was subsidized by the Virgin Islands government to the tune of about $1.4 billion. It, it's now shut down. Um, and the last stage of empire, and I'll, I'll end here very quickly just so you can understand the arc, um, is what I call neoliberal empire. Um, in the 1970s, beginning with the Carter administration, there's a huge push to demand, uh, quote unquote, more self-sufficiency, which is a theme that goes back uh, to the early colonial government of the Philippines, um, and, um, and more investments in industries that would allow the colonies um, to be able to support their own civil budgets off whatever they're manufacturing, whatever they're producing, to stop demanding, quote unquote, subsidies from the American federal state. Um, and this really is sort of the theme that moves through probably today. Um, you see again and again, if you look at federal correspondence with US territories, demands for more fiscal accountability, um, complaints about um, profligate spending, um, concerns about the level of debt. Although many of these problems are created by the very restrictions the U.S. state has set up for U.S. territories. And so I just want to end with what I kind of see as the legacy of the BIA here in this long and very brief overview. One is that U.S. territories remain in tremendous debt. Um, this is a comparison of just the, the, the debt as percentage of GDP um, to the, the, the U.S. states that have the highest rates of debt. You can see, for example, the Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, uh, Guam have much, much higher rates of debt um, than most American states. Um, perhaps most famously was Puerto Rico uh, that had to undergo the PROMESA uh, debt restructuring process. The other thing that was initial goal of the BIA that is largely accomplished is the empire remains largely hidden. I mean, this is partially why we're having these conversations today and through the 1898 project. And the best evidence I can give you of that is a, is a survey after 2017. This was right after the hurricane hit Puerto Rico that asked Americans if they knew that whether people born in Puerto Rico were citizens of the United States or not. Um, and a bare majority could answer that question correctly, only 54%. I mean, young people were even less likely to understand that. The last is that the pot, there's been either population, a lack of population growth or population decline um, in many of the territories. And this is primarily because of a lack of economic opportunities. Um, Guam is really the only US territory that, whose population continues to grow. The Virgin Islands has been flat for a very long time. American Samoa is declining partly because of the, uh, of the decline of its tuna canning industry, another loophole economic intervention. I mean, Puerto Rico has seen huge population declines after the hurricane, um, but that started well before then. And so today, I think if we're going to reflect on the situations in U.S. territories, we're also reflecting on the consequences of long-term political subordination. Um, in exchange for greater autonomy, Congress and the BIA, or the Office of Territories, uh, has demanded more self-sufficiency, something that very few U.S. states would be able to meet. Um, under the BIA and the Office of Territories, the economic base of many territories has developed primarily to take advantage of its unique relationship to the United States. Uh, these neoliberal reforms um, have put them even, even, in even more precarious positions because they've developed industries that are entirely dependent on the maintenance of specific exemptions from trade or tax laws. And the political result of this, I would argue, is that it's undermined the territorial government's ability to resist Washington. Um, because they're so in fear of losing favor, of dooming their fragile uh, local economies to changes in U.S. federal policy. So I'll, I'll end there. I, that's a very brief overview of a huge amount of history in many places, and I hope that this will generate more, more questions than I've attempted to answer today. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to introduce uh, our three respondents each coming from one of the, uh, a focus on one of the regions that 
have dealt with the consequences of what Collins laid out for us. I'd like to introduce uh, Rod Labrador, who's a professor of ethnic studies here at the University of Hawaii. Uh, Marie Therese Napori, who is the director of the Pacific Islands Development Program at the East West Center. And Tom Kaufman, Hawaiian historian for the 19th and 20th centuries, and the author of such books as Nation, A Nation Within. Um, I guess everybody could come up here. I hope the microphone can move. And uh, we'll get each of the respondents to offer a response and then open things up. That is exactly why. <laughs> and uh, what we're going to do is have each respondent basically situate what Colin was talking about in relation to the Philippines, Guam, and Hawaii. And we're going to start, as Colin started out by saying, uh, Guam was just too complicated to talk about in the amount of time he had. So, of course, we're going to start with Mary Therese to give us a, a view from Guam. Happening. Actually, um, I'll, I'll pass this around. This is the original 1898 project published in um, 1998. It's available. This is a publication of American Friends, serve with the American Friends Service Committee. Uh, Resistance in Par Paradise, Rethinking 100 Years of U.S. Involvement in the uh, Caribbean and the Pacific. And I'll pass that around. You can actually find the whole PDF online. And um, my uh, older sister, historian and uh, Paris Hattori, uh, broke me into working in this, on this publication on the Guam piece, the Marianas piece, uh, when I was an undergrad. And uh, this is a really good overview, especially for educators. It actually has worksheets, uh, guiding questions. Uh, I really, uh, in, in response to, to Colin's work, I, I really appreciate the way you brought in some of the other islands that, that people in the US uh, and, and in Hawaii are not always uh, aware of. Uh, I think from a Chamorro perspective, you know, these, these events, uh, are difficult for me because it's not an academic, um, this is not an academic exercise, right? This is my, my past, uh, my present, and my future uh, as a Chamorro. Uh, Guam remains um, one of the um, few non-self-governing territories. Uh, the United Nations continues to raise this as an issue. People of Guam continue to raise that as an issue. Uh, and so, for me, this is, is sometimes challenging, so I, I, I really appreciate the, the perspectives you're sharing, um, providing more context uh, to show, you know, as a tomorrow, I am not alone in this, and uh, sadly, uh, I am not alone. Um, the, um, I think, you know, one of the important things to understand is that the Bureau, uh, in all of its iterations, continues to remain uh, influential and impactful in the lives not just of uh, Chamorros and members of other territories, uh, but they are also the, the lead implementer of the Compacts of Free Association um, in conjunction with the Department of Defense, Department of State, and, and other U.S. agencies. Uh, and, and so the, the United States uh, continues to assert that America is a Pacific nation, and uh, yet if we look at the way the U.S. has treated uh, Native Hawaiians, you talked about Red Hill, uh, the territories, Guahan still de denied self-determination, um, no voting representation in Congress, and uh, look at what's happening with the Compacts of Free Association, uh, though they've been uh, extended, they've not been funded, right? So how is, um, how is the United States treating its, its Pacific territories and the islands with which we've had, we've had long uh, and continuing through, through uh, Insular Affairs and uh, Department of Interior, continuing relationships. Uh, and that is how the rest of the world will judge the veracity of the, the statement that the United States is a Pacific nation. 
so I encourage, uh, I don't want to uh, take up too much time and, and perhaps can respond to questions later, but the, the, you know, the, the publication that's going around I think is a, is a great way to learn more about this. Uh, the U.S. remains, in my view, an empire. And um, there's, there's another great book. I appreciate the, the publications from the, the members of uh, this, this group. Uh, other people who have contributed to 1898. There's an interesting, more recent book called How to Hide an Empire. Um, can't remember the, the author off the top of my head, but really uh, in, interesting if you're, I, I think that, that would be a valuable resource as well. And then the um, April um, 13 and 14, events also a great way to learn more about uh, not just Guam, but all of the other areas impacted by the events of 1898. Uh, and then, you know, those of you who are interested in, in U.S. history, I think continuing to look at the, the primary um, resources, and I, I think, you know, six million documents and, and many still not digitized, Right, there's a lot out there and a lot more that we can uncover and the more we know, uh, I think the, um, the more we're better able to situate ourselves tomorrow's within the um, wider uh, history of uh, US imperialism. Uh, and sorry, it's not just the history, right? We are, it is still, uh, we are still an imperial nation. So, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. try to make mine brief as well. Um, so Colin, thank you for uh, the talk. I really, the thing that I was kind of really drawn to was the, the ways that you were talking about uh, making these territories, the, the Philippines in my case, uh, making them legible through bureaucracies and the kind of uh, easier management, uh, colonial management. Uh, a couple of things that I wanted to kind of ask you. Um, was to think about the kind of administrative gridding of the Philippines during this period. So uh, something different between the Spanish colonization and American colonialism in the Philippines, the ways that the bureaucracies are, uh, or like the, B the BIA, the way that they create different kinds of administrative grids in the Philippines and what that means in terms of creating things like uh, different ethno-linguistic groups that we think we take as natural now but might not have been during that period. Um, and looking at the ways that Filipinos or what people that we now call Filipinos get raced in a particular way um, in the, the archipelago. But the, this is also in line with the, the broader thing that I wanted to ask you is that where does American ideas about race and ideologies about race and racism where does that figure in, in the ways we see like an empire? And so where do we see, like, how do we understand things like uh, America being American Indian, right? Because the way that we see it being American Indian is a different way that they treat different kinds of folks in the Philippines, so that folks in the northern part of the Philippines or in the southern part of the Philippines get seen as different types of races than rolling Christians or uh, folks in different areas. And so where do ideas around like American Indianness fit in, so the kind of reservation systems that are established in the Philippines? Um, how do we understand things like blackness and whiteness? Uh, how are we engaging in ideas around what it means to be Oriental or Asian during this time period? And how is that kind of figuring in, in the ways that we understand the, the people in the Philippines? And then lastly, um, there was an interesting thing that you put up with, uh, um, and this is in line with what the questions that I'm asking. Uh, you put up a slide in there with the, the BIA and the St. Louis Mercantile Trust Company, and it's super interesting because it's 1904, which is the Louisiana uh, Purchase Expo, right? Which is one of the ways that Americans get to see the Philippines and get to understand the Philippines and the ways that Filipinos get kind of. Uh, is brought into the American imagination. So things that we take kind of for granted, particularly here in Hawaii, like the, the stereotype of Filipinos as dog eaters. This is one of the ways that it circulates. It starts there and it begins to circulate. And here in Hawaii, that is something that gets maintained 
right? But looking at those things where we're looking at business, bureaucracy, but we're also looking at questions around race and racism. And then the other thing that you put up, I actually looked at that record. One of the things that it talks about is like in the first pages, it looks at these different territories as orphans, right? As orphans and as children. And so where do, do ideas around race and racism fit into this kind of infantilization of these colonial territories? I'll end with that. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone. Thank you, Craig, for uh, all the way you keep us going. It's amazing. Um, and um, I did uh, mostly come to uh, try to urge everybody to stay with this conversation um, because it is a uh, basically um, a, a effort, a very worked out effort to broaden and deepen our knowledge base and our connectedness and uh, some sense of where we might go from here. Um, and when I say that, I think of uh, the <clears throat> big steps that were taken in 1993 with the uh, observance of the overthrow and in 1898 with the observance of the annexation. And now we are 25 years later and um, we've set up this call, this kahea. And <clears throat> what we're realizing is we have <clears throat> tremendous resources and tremendous interests. So this thing is, this has been taking on a life of its own but we have persons like um, all, uh, all three of the panelists. Um, and Colin is uh, a, a longtime friend of mine, and I had no idea that he had written this book, let alone that he could deliver a lecture like he just delivered. And, um, and so I'm starting to hear about uh, Marie's work, and Rod uh, was, uh, recommended to us highly by none other than Amy Agbayani, you know, so. <laughs> this yeah, is just how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so, you know, this is a very open-ended process. And so part of what I'm saying is that this is what we're up to, but, you know, get involved. Uh, make up your own program and we will um, help, you know, connect it to other resources or to uh, promote it. Um, I did want to say in response, I was kind of boggled by listening to Colin's uh, description of the Bureau um, because I I am aware from my research about how intimately the, the events of 1898 connect uh, Hawaii with uh, Guam, the Philippines, and Puerto Rico, and Cuba, and, and then how it sets in motion this, you know, the Pacific America, uh, uh, America's Pacific Lake, you know, that things we've lived with. And um, as I listened, I thought, how was it that in the, I'll, I'll give you an, I'll give you an example, I'll give you an extreme example real quick. I'll try to be very brief. Um, one of the most important uh, pieces of, of history, colonization history, is this um, you know ignorance about what 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 we had gotten into, meaning what the United States had gotten into, and what we had done, and how uh, it might relate to world events, and um, uh, and in that process, an unwillingness 
really a lack of support by the general public uh, to spend money. And part of it was to spend money on, uh, there's, there's destructive militarization occurs, very destructive, but there is not adequate militarization to defend against uh, the rising power of Asia, Japan. And there was a, uh, about one-fifth of the garrison of the Philippines um, that was required by militant American military planners to defend in the case of an attack. And in Hawaii, it was probably 10 to 15 percent of what was calculated by military planners. And what, what was the first military plant, the Orange Plant, 1907, which was then constantly updated. Constantly updated, and so it wasn't as if the American military didn't think about it, but the central uh, situation never changed. And um, uh, people like Teddy Roosevelt, who had probably more than any other American instigated this entire um, scenario, the, the entire big scenario, uh, had said, I think and it's, it's, uh, there's reference to it in your book, something like 1907, he said, uh, I don't know what we're doing in the Philippines, it's of little value. And uh, he subsequently said, or said prior to that, I'm not sure, well, uh, the Philippines is a, our Achilles heel, militarily. And so when December 7th came, um, the Philippines is instantly bombarded and invaded. Guam is instantly taken over by the Japanese and uh, uh, there's, you know, 2,400 people killed in Hawaii and the uh, much of the American fleet is sink sitting in the bottom of Pearl Harbor. Um, as a result of, really, the Imperial America's uh, Imperial step, the, let us say, non-judgmentally, okay, but the poorly thought out idea, what, and what a horrendous idea it turned out to be. Um, so, it occurred to me as I listened to Colin that basic no, uh, knowledge such as this is completely hidden from us, really. It's, we're completely isolated from it. We're not conversant in it, but every time we've had one of these warm-up events, what I see is suddenly there's conversation, conversation, because we do see what the interconnectedness of this is. And it gives me a strong sense of the urgency of pursuing that. Um, loss of sovereignty and self-direction is a major, major subject that we're working on. Militarization of uh, our different spaces. The huge amount of land space and ocean space that's been appropriated by the United States government. Um, and the loss of, uh, the resultant loss of resources and the environmental degradation that has occurred is, if we started to add up across all of these spaces, it is astonishing, and it is scandalous, okay. Uh, and then we're also going to work on um, resistance, uh, the efficacy of protest, cultural perpetuation, linguistic preparation, etc., and then um, restoration movements for land, uh, shore, and ocean. And um, uh, Colin, um, do you want me to ask you a question? I want to ask you a question. Sure. To keep this going, and it is, um, 
uh, how, from your point of view of your oversight bureau, how Hawaii became so isolated from all of these other places when the history is so intricately uh, involved? Um, I think the short answer to that is because the it's because the territorial sugar oligarchy wanted it that way. Uh, but one of the reasons, um, I mean, I think that there is an assumption that there was a, uh, you know, a, a, a very close relationship between Washington and the governing oligarchy of territorial Hawaii. In, in my experience, that's for my research, that's really not the case. That they were happy to have security guarantees, but they wanted Hawaii to be governed as a territory because this allowed them to govern Hawaii by themselves without much interference from Washington. Um, and so I think that's it's one of the reasons why there was an insistence um, after the Republic uh, that Hawaii would be managed as a US uh, territory like continental territories, not a, as an overseas empire, um, where of course there was a governor appointed by, from Washington. But I, my, my answer to that, or at least my understanding, um, is that they were the ones who pushed for for that isolation, because it allowed them to economically and politically dominate Hawaii without even much interference from the BIA or um, a Washington-based bureaucracy. And it gave them even more power. They gave who? The 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 uh, the, the, the sugar the the, um, the, sugar. the sugar oligarchy. Yeah. The five. Yeah. Okay, I just. Ask of uh, both Rod and uh, Ray Perez about you know, Rod was raising the issues of, of racism and the other kinds of dynamics and literally starting to uh, exacerbate divisions that already existed within population. I was just wondering for each of you if you could just talk a bit about and it's very broad, but what are the consequences of that kind of administration? What would you say are the one or two biggest ongoing and sort of pervasive consequences of being put into this kind of relationship. You know, the, one of the, um, the, the most um, troubling um, things to me is, are the insular cases and the, the um, territorial incorporation doctrine which still impact Guam and and one of the quotes that uh, my older sister, uh, Dr. Ann, often uses is that um, we were described, the overseas territories were described as being inhabited by alien races differing from America in religion, customs, and modes of thought, making it impossible to govern according to Anglo-Saxon principles. That still stands today and, and I think speaks to this, this pater you know, like we're orphans, right? America is our father, uh, and that we are unable to govern ourselves. We are still unable to govern ourselves. Uh, and so I, I think for me, this is, this is the legacy, and, and well, not the legacy, the reality uh, that we still have to deal with. I think there's a, a similar kind of thing that can be said about the Philippines. Um, I think uh, one of the things that Colin really kind of highlighted is the the kind of bureaucracies and the kind of um, economic dependencies that were kind of created uh, during this period. So I think that's also that's an important part. The kind of political economic aspects of it. Um, some of the things I'm I've been more interested in are the kind of the, the racial projects that are involved as part of that. And so the things that I'm kind of looking at is you know with the creation of this idea of Filipino through the BIA and through other mechanisms in the Philippines, you know, they're creating this idea of Filipino. What does that then mean for those, those of us who come to Hawaii to work on the sugar plantations? What does that mean for those who go and work on, uh, as farm workers on the West Coast or the canneries, right? What does that mean in terms of our relationship to the homeland uh, as well as what it means in a larger kind of political economy? 